Today I will be continuing my discussion on the spinal shock and in this lecture I will provide the physiological basis of the spinal shock and uh, the treatment strategies the what happens after spinal shock in the spinal cord and the treatment strategies uh, that is what I want to look in and I am trying to give you the current concepts available regarding the spinal shock okay so that means uh, there are two things one the current concepts and I will be taking you further uh, the I will taking it further to the discussion I had made yesterday here is a beautiful painting of uh, Robert uh, Waite. He's a physician, a Scottish physician. He is the person for the first time described the phenomena of spinal shock. And in his words, uh, it is a loss of sensation accompanied by motor paralysis with a gradual recovery of reflexes. So look, uh, this is where we started in 1750, maybe even earlier than that also, it must have been there, but uh, he for the first time recorded uh, the spinal shock. That's Robert Witt. Now, the plan of the lecture is as shown here I define the spinal shock again for your um, recapitulation and I will again mention about the magnitude of the problem and I will talk about the phases of the spinal shock with a current situation with a current uh, knowledge then I will talk about the physiological mechanisms responsible for a different phases of the spinal shock. I will deal with them. Then I will talk about the long-term effects of spinal shock. In between, I will mention about uh, the various aspects of the spinal shock, all the reflexes involved in the spinal shock, maybe here in this uh, item four. Then I will mention briefly about the treatment strategies for the spinal shock and I summarize. That is uh, uh, my plan of lecture today. Definition. It is a spinal shock is a state of non-responsiveness of all the spinal activity due to sudden loss of suprasegmental control caudal to the injury. So it's a rather little little difficult. That means a after an injury, there is a non-responsiveness of the spinal activity, and this is not controlled by the suprasegmental influences. That is what the spinal shock is. Yesterday, I mentioned about the magnitude of the problem. Today, I again review that. The road accidents and automobile accidents constitutes more than 50% of the spinal cord injuries. Second most group is the old age people who have osteoporosis, where their bones have become brittle and they slip and fall in a house environment that is in mostly in the uh, bathrooms and then they will uh, have the vertebral column injured or the spinal cord injured this forms the second largest group and uh, uh, it may so happen that this second largest group uh, uh, may further take on because the old age uh, people are increasing then Third point is uh, the occupational, that occupations that have an effect on the, the spinal cord. 
so these occupational injury or the work related injuries or occupation related injuries say for example the workers these um, the civil workers for uh, uh, construction and the uh, construction of the houses bridges or whatever the uh, civil works uh, they may fall and they may get injured and uh, the least are the uh, tumors and uh, metastatic tumors uh, that reach the spinal cord and then they break more than 50% of the injuries they produce a permanent disability and this permanent disability depending upon the level at which the spinal cord is involved if it is at the lower level the disability may be smaller extent if it is happening at a quadriplegia so that means he will not be able to uh, walk or uh, he will be just uh, bedridden and okay that's one aspect the second aspect the bladder and the bowel control is lost so that becomes another important uh, issue in the management of uh, uh, spinal cord injury <clears throat> what are the challenges of the spinal cord injury and they because the spinal cord injury can cause a complex damage a surprising amount of the basic circuitry to control movements and process information can remain intact see what happens if there is an injury at a t6 level uh, about t6 level it is uh, the circuitry is normal that means t4 uh, t2 whatever the above that t6 is normal below the t6 maybe for example you take take for example t8 t9 i am just uh, the one one step i am just leaving uh, as a gap Uh, t8 t9 the circuitries are normal they are intact they are not damaged only thing they lost control of the supra uh, spinal uh, influences this is because the spinal cord is arranged in layers this uh, circuitry is in layer or it is in stratified many of the connections and neuronal cell bodies forming this circuitry above and below the site as i was trying to explain uh, they sir they are surviving because they are not injured and how these surviving neurons can proliferate or can regenerate to make the connections a proper connections and regain the activity that's the challenge with this uh, challenge and this is what yesterday i mentioned about the the stages of the the spinal shock i made into three stages stage of placidity non responsiveness that is immediate then a stage of appearance of a reflex activity which further become exaggerated or hyperreflexia it may happen from one day to one year and a stage of the failure of the reflex activity any time during the time of recovery this failure of the reflex activity is because of the infection toxemia and other things happening during the recovery stage so now with the advent of the antibiotics availability of the treat and availability of the treatment protocols we know exactly what the level the damage is because of the ct scans mris uh, we know by millimeter by millimeter where the damage is so under this circumstances we are able to manage uh, the spinal cord injury very well and uh, that is why the stage 3 is absolutely disappeared i think i i mentioned here stage of spinal shock uh, serotonin period serotonin uh, serotonin uh, is a father of neuroscience this classification belongs to this era now with this uh, advent i i mentioned so the stage 3 is out of uh, usually it is not in the extinct extinct uh, situation now we need to relook re into the phases of the or the stages of the spinal shock recently 
a group of workers they took up the issue and they have reviewed the uh, spinal shock and they have given the following four phases and these four phases include areflexia or hyporeflexia that is same as before then initial reflex return that is also same as return but now this reflex return is made into early hyperreflexia and rate hyperreflexia that means there are four phases of the spinal shock a reflexia initial reflex return early hyperreflexia and late hyperreflexia now we will look into this uh, the importance of the different phases the these phases reflect the changes happening in the neuronal plasticity after spinal cord injury neuronal plasticity means the neuronal growth neuronal adaptability the synaptic contact the upper regulation so on so forth all those are neuronal plasticity after spinal cord injury so these these indicate that then there would be the production of a denervation supersensitivity that allows the return of the spinal reflexes in 1 to 3 days subsequently from weeks to months the axons they sprout and grow to to make the new synaptic contacts and synapses and that may result in hyperreflexia that means the development of hyperreflexia indicate the these axonal growth and the synapse formation time course of synapse formation is protracted that long time months to year and for full evolution the entire hyperreflexia uh, because the synaptic growth requires the axonal growth axonal growth uh, takes place very slowly and uh, that is length dependent in addition there is a upregulation of the postsynaptic receptors and the upregulation of the presynaptic neurotransmitter synthesis and uh, the presynaptic uh, growth factor synthesis so that is also is happening further the synapse growth is also activity dependent so that means uh, the phases indicate all these processes and that will give a clinician or a physician or a neurologist to see that it is going in a direction expected let us understand the chronological manifestations of the four phases of the spinal shock the phase 1 0 to 1 day the, and this phase 1 is a reflexia or a hyporeflexia here what is the physiological basis of this thing there is a loss of control of descending facilitatory influences that means excitatory inputs coming from uh, supraspinal segment it's or cut phase 2 because now that is the that is the that is the period that is a cut then what happens in the phase 2 so phase 2 is happening within 1 to 3 days that means there is a returning of the reflex activity that is the initial reflex return and this returning of the reflex activity is because of the physiological changes that produce the super sensitivity what is called a denervation a super sensitivity so that uh, the reflexes uh, try to resume because the, the postsynaptic uh, Uh, activity increases or produces a response even to a smaller uh, amount of a transmitter release phase 3 1 to 4 weeks so this is initial hyperreflexia that means within a month initial hyperreflexia where there is a axon supported synaptic growth the phase 4 happens between 1 to 12 months it is a final hyperreflexia it is the a neuronal soma supported synaptic growth here it is the axonal growth it is the somatic growth so these were the scientists who who just uh, gave these ideas 
Now, let us consider one by one. The phase one I'm taking here. The phase one, phase of A reflexia or hyperreflexia happening between zero to one day. What is the observation during this period? During this period, the observation, uh, the physiological observation is the motor neurons are hyperpolarized. So that means uh, motor neurons are not responsive. And the non-responsiveness of the motor neurons or the neurons is due to loss, lost normal background excitation. That means uh, the excitatory inputs from the uh, supraspinal segments is lost. So then there would be increased spinal inhibition. That means the interneurons present in this thing, they will be producing more inhibition, more inhibition. Then there is a loss of uh, plateau potentials, that is extent potentials in the spinal neurons due to uh, loss of certain neurotransmitters, especially the serotonin. Now, there is a Another important aspect coming up, there is a decreased neuronal metabolism because of the injury or the inflammation. Then there will be retraction of the dendrites and uh, the even uh, synaptic loss. These are the five mechanisms that were attributed for the motor neuropolarization that is producing this areflexia or hyperreflexia. Then uh, going to phase two, so this is the initial phase of a reflex return from no reflex to now the reflex is coming back. It happens within one to three days and that has been attributed. The observations here attributed to the increased sensitivity of the postsynaptic receptors. And this increased sensitivity is attributed to the mechanisms listed here. So that means there is a decrease in the excitatory neurotransmitter uptake. There is an increased synthesis and insertion of receptors. That is an upregulation of receptors postsynaptically. There is a downregulation and a degradation of the receptors. There is a uh, altered synthesis and composition of the receptor subunits. So the NMDA receptor upregulation is seen, even uh, the NMDA receptor components, uh, the NR1 and NR2 components, they are also upregulated. So then because of the inactivity in the first phase one, there is an inactivity dependent receptor upregulation. So again, it comes back here in the receptor regulation. In addition, there is an increase in the neurotransmitter synthesis and a growth factor synthesis. All these things uh, would lead to what is called a supersensitivity, denervation supersensitivity, as well as the increased number of receptors, what we call as a receptor upregulation. That brings back the uh, reflex back to the some extent reflexes come back that happens uh, within one to three days. Now, then phase three, this is the early hyperreflexia. This is happening, uh, this event is happening between one to four weeks. Here, what is the observation? There is the growth of the synapse or the synapse, form synapse formation. And those synapses are having a short excess. So that means, uh, uh, synapses with short exons are grown in this period of time. Now, what what is the mechanisms? The new synapse formation to occupy the vacated synaptic sites because it is cut, the synapse is damaged, and the vacated site is occupied by the uh, formation of the new synapse. This synapse may be uh, now, what is there? If it is cut, there is no there is no cell there. It may be an exon or a dendritic uh, uh, growth that is making a synaptic contact. So this may be an exodendritic uh, type of a, a synapse. Then synaptic growth is triggered by the neurotransmitter retrograde signals. So that means uh, uh, neurotransmitters are not being able to be activated. So they will give a signal back to the synaptic growth. 
and there is a competitive and activity dependent uh, uh, stimulus if there is more activity the more uh, stimuli are reaching to the postsynaptic side and that would uh, in turn uh, enhance the growth of the presynaptic and the postsynaptic activity so then stimulation of a growth of a synapse with a short so that means this happening is only with a, a short exon interneurons so that means they are the ones of which are uh, trying to grow so long exon neuronal synapses especially the long exon neuronal synapses uh, this one a apparent uh, coming from the intrafusal fibers uh, uh, to the alpha motor neuron uh, they are uh, not uh, been uh, formed so there is a limitation with this uh, particular uh, uh, long axonal uh, pattern this long axon may be one afferent or maybe one which is coming from the corticospinal uh, tract so now this is uh, in in terms of electrophysiology there will be a plateau potentials in the axon potentials and uh, uh, calcium channels this is why happening with a, a calcium channel involvement in the spinal neurons this is a early hyperreflexia and if early hyperreflexia is uh, activity dependent and uh, this is because of the calcium channels and uh, it is because of the increased uh, neurotransmitter retrograde signals and uh, they produce uh, these uh, short exon interneurons to go or the synapses with the short exon interneurons going back going further with the uh, late stage that is happening between 1 to 12 month this is phase 4 this is a late hyperreflexia what is the obser observation here so synapse growth with the long axons and soma both are happening that means uh, synapses with the soma synapses with the long axons uh, they are happening and uh, this is happening because of the uh, growth by long axon neurons for example one year for and uh, the descending influences uh, they will grow and the soma supplied uh, synapse growth that means uh, uh, the growth <coughs> sorry about that okay soma supplied synapse growth uh, via exon transport because of the axonal transport the soma exon uh, soma uh, is uh, growing and that would make a synapse and there is a competitive and activity dependent uh, synaptic growth these are the four phases i have made what is happening here and what is the mechanism involved in each one of them now uh, coming back those four four phases uh, whatever we are mentioning uh, they can be assessed uh, by number of uh, clinical testings there are nearly 12 reflexes that can be clinically elicited and monitored in spinal shock and i am mentioning these 12 reflexes and these reflexes they change their response pattern whether they disappear appear or they become more pronounced so they change their response pattern indicating the progression and improvement of the spinal shock one of those reflexes the chronology i am talking about how they are appearing and what happens to them one of them is a delayed plantar response what happens to delayed plantar response i will tell what is delayed plantar response in the next slide but before that let us see what happens to it delayed plantar response uh, by 1 to 0 to 1 day this becomes uh, hyper increased enhanced and uh, it remains enhanced in the 1 to 3 days and uh, after a week or so it disappears normally it is not seen delayed plantar response is not seen and uh, it disappears it disappears here so that means it is a, it, it indicates the progression if the delayed plantar response is not disappearing by 8 days or so so that indicates that uh, the particular spinal cord injury is not doing well so now what is this delayed plantar response here you see the sole of the foot and in this delayed plantar response 
the sole of the foot is stimulated in the arrow starting from here uh, to this in this direction this uh, you take a, a blunt blunt instrument stroke along in this direction and this stroking is not gentle this is a, a very strong that means deeply press this thing and the move it further and uh, along with in this direction that means you go to the toes and going to the uh, the first toe here so instrument upward from the lateral side towards the toes along with the lateral sole of the foot uh, continued medially across uh, this is the volar area the prominence the volar area and that will make the metatarsal joints after the stimulus is applied some delay that these toes will flex there is a plantar flexion after the stimulus is applied the onset of a plantar flexion response these toes flex and of the great toe or other toes and this is very delayed this is always delayed it does not happen uh, quickly and this thing is not seen in a normal healthy individuals this is seen after spinal cord injury and uh, this uh, that means within 0 to 1 day it is seen and this disappears after a week or so so that means this response that means there is a growth of other responses which is trying to inhibit this thing now if you see that the delayed plantar response is exaggerated zero to one day here and one to three days here and it disappears it's just a plus or zero plus or zero here subsequently then comes another reflex the bulbo cavernous reflex this is uh, uh, looking, I will tell about the bulbo cavernous reflex. This, what happens to this thing? It is absent in the first day because all the reflexes are abolished, excepting this. Uh, the, all the reflexes are, there is an areflexia. So now this is the stage of areflexia or the phase of areflexia. This is absent and this becomes exaggerated, exaggerated, exaggerated. So that means a uh, bulbo cavernous reflex uh, recovers and becomes pronounced uh, subsequently in phase two, three, and four. It remains throughout. What is this bulbo cavernous reflex? This is one of the superficial reflexes. So our reflexes can be classified into superficial reflexes and the deep reflexes. The deep reflexes involves the deep tendon reflexes. And the superficial reflexes involve the, the plantar reflex, the abdominal reflex, the bulbo cavernous reflex, the anal reflex, and uh, uh, cremister reflexes. So bulbo cavernous reflex is one of them. Uh, to test involves monitoring the external anal sphincter contraction. So that means uh, the contraction of the external or internal and external anal sphincter muscle contraction in response to a squeezing of the uh, glans penis or clitoris or while you are introducing a, a catheter because uh, usually the spinal cord uh, the spinal cord uh, injury patients they will be uh, introduced with a catheter because to maintain the bladder functions so when you are introducing a catheter you will get the anal sphincter contraction that indicates that is the bulbo cavernous reflex and this reflex is a, it's a somatic reflex and it has a it has the uh, center in the uh, sacral segments uh, uh, second to fourth that is briefly about uh, bulbo cavernous reflex this is elicited by stimulation of the glans penis or clitoris or by catheterization, contraction of the internal and anal sphincter, that is the response, and the center is this. That is one aspect. Moving further, we have seen the delayed plantar response, and we have now seen the bulbo cavernous reflex. And this bulbo cavernous reflex was of center. This is one of the superficial reflex. We have another superficial reflex, 
this is the anal wink reflex. So this is a, a perineal reflex or a, the anal reflex. I will I will describe it about how how this is elicited. Before that, what happens to this anal reflex? It is it is absent. This is superficial reflex. This is also a superficial reflex. This was absent in the beginning because in the day phase one and phase two this reappears and it is enhanced or pronounced so that is the anal wink reflex and this anal wink reflex what is that it is also known as a anal reflex or a perineal reflex or enocutaneous enocutaneous reflex it is the contraction reflexive contraction of the external anal sphincter upon stroking the skin around the anus okay these reflexes usually we do not elicit in a normal situation but in case of a spinal cord injury we may want to monitor we may want to see the progression we need to do these things so that means uh, the stroking the skin around the anus that is the perineal area there is a contraction of the external anal sphincter and this is stroking or whatever it is it is not a gentle one it should be a noxious tactile stimulus it is a, a noxious stimulus that produces the wink or a small contraction of the anal sphincter and that is why this is the anal wink reflex the stimulus is detected by the nociceptors located in the perineal skin that is taken by the pudendal nerve and this would reach the sacral segment of second and fourth and then it would come back through the sacral segment to the muscles the anal external sphincteric muscles so that is center is second to fourth so this is a anal wink reflex what happened that was a anal wink reflex was absent and it was exaggerated and we look at another superficial reflex what is a cremasteric reflex i will mention about the cremasteric reflex in the next slide so what happens to it it was absent because it is a superficial reflex and it gets pronounced in phase two phase three phase four what is cremasteric reflex the chemistric reflex is a superficial reflex that is elicited when inner part of the thigh is stroked. What happens when the inner part of the thigh is stroked? The uh, testis is lifted up and it reaches to the inguinal corner. That means it is retracted. The testis is uh, retracted and uh, uh, this testicle uh, reaches towards the inguinal canal because where this uh, uh, cremastric muscle that is the contraction of the cremastric muscle uh, pulls the testicle up so like other superficial reflex it is simply graded as present or absent and uh, the the center here is in the lumbar segments l1 and l2 the cremastric muscle that means uh, a stroking of the inner part of the thigh then contraction of the cremastric muscle. The contraction leads to the uh, pulling of the testicle towards the inguinal canal. That means pulling it up and uh, the central is L1 and L2. Now, so that was absent. So now we have another reflex response, Babinski sign. This is also a superficial reflex. This is known as a plantar reflex. So this delayed plantar response was different and the Babinski sign is different. So now Babinski sign is also a plantar reflex. And uh, this plantar reflex, what happens? It was absent. There is a reflexia zero here. It's absent. So in one to three days, it appears. It appears. It's not as pronounced here. These, these things were pronounced. It appears and uh, it gets... Uh, pronounced in phase three and phase four so this is babinski sign so when babinski sign is absent so that means there is no response no response now what is this babinski sign i have already mentioned in the earlier class i revise it again 
again we are using the same type of format you are scratching the outer sole of the foot in this same same direction as i had mentioned but uh, the um, intensity of the scratch may not be as high as that now what happens in a normal situation when you stroke it like this these uh, there is a flexion of the toes this is called a flexion of the toe especially the greater toe and the other toes the small these toes they will come to the medial side there is adduction the adduction flexion motion of this thing this is called a, a negative babinski sign babinski sign is negative if this is a, a plantar if there is a plantar flexion of the toes and adduction of the uh, other toes in case we mentioned that it was absent absent means this reflex there is no response no plantar flexion nothing so that is a zero negative is plantar flexion so then what so in case of certain conditions when you do this uh, uh, the lateral uh, striking the lateral margin so then what happens uh, these uh, great toe moves in this direction this is a dorsiflexion dorsiflexion and these toes they will fan out the fan out uh, so you can just see that here what is happening there is a adduction they will all come and they will try to have a plantar flexion it will fan out and this type of response is known as a extensor response this is an extensor response and it is known as a positive babinski sign so i have mentioned babinski sign positive it's an abnormal situation it happens in case of upper motor neuron lesion babinski sign is negative that's a normal situation in health it is normal there is a plantar flexion and adduction only during health during sleep or in uh, infants it may be positive because of the growth of the cortical or the myelination of the corticospinal tract so absent zero means absent is no response that means one of the uh, path in the reflex arc is interrupted so that is absent i have mentioned these things uh, scratching of the outer side of the sole of the foot negative response is the plantar flexion of the toes and adduction of the toes the positive response is the the dorsiflexion of the toes and the fanning of all the toes this is the positive response it happens in upper motor neuron lesion and the uh, uh, center for this babinski sign is at uh, l5 and s1 s1 carries the afferent inputs l5 is the efferent pathway this one so that means the touch with a pin so with the draw is not taking place so this there is zero and in 1 to 3 days it is still not able to respond and subsequently it responds and there is a over response withdrawal is immense that is what we saw yesterday the mass reflex that is a flexor withdrawal reflex now from 2 to 6 all these are superficial reflexes there is all these superficial reflexes if i were to sum them they were absent here they have increased here slowly there is appearance and in phase 3 they appeared and uh, in phase 4 they appeared or they are exaggerated then we have a deep tendon reflexes tapping of the tendon either a tendon acellus or a quadriceps make a monosynaptic contact and produce the alpha motor neuron activity this is a deep tendon reflex it was absent here and it was absent here in 1 to 3 days and it starts appearing uh, um in the sec third phase third phase and uh, it is uh, exaggerated so is another the electrophysiological component of the deep tendon reflex tbl h reflex it is uh, similar to deep tendon reflex i will mention about that in the next slide it was absent and it was uh, see exaggerated and it became and we record the activity electrical activity when we stimulate with the low intensity that would go to the the spinal cord 
and they would excite the alpha motor neurons supplying the soleus now this is what happens so this is where the stimulus is applied this is where the stimulus is applied and uh, when the stimulus is applied it it traverses through these and then have a synaptic uh, uh, contact and comes back to the uh, alpha motor neuron uh, here to the extrathesal fibers and when this at this neuromuscular junction there is a potential formed and this potential is a h reflex it is nothing but uh, a electrophysiological counterpart of the uh, uh, stretch reflex it's precisely a stretch reflex a stretch reflex is a monosynaptic reflex that is because of the activation of the intrafusal fibers by a tap on the tendon that activates the 1a and 1a comes here makes synapse and contracts the extrafusal fibers that is what you see mechanically now what here you are doing you are stimulating those fibers that means with the low intensity stimulation you will activate these fibers and they would produce uh, the monosynaptic activity and the activity is picked up in the electrophysiological pattern uh, like uh, um, mentioned or um, by the, this is also known as a Hoffman uh, reflex uh, because he described it for the first time the tblh reflex what happened to it the tblh reflex was absent in the phase one and it becomes exaggerated and it becomes normal and it is more exaggerated now that is a uh, the deep reflexes so these two are deep reflexes and these deep reflexes are exaggerated they were absent and they were uh, little late to uh, little late to appear as compared to these uh, superficial reflexes. Now, we have other two reflexes. These are extensor spasm. This is a positive support uh, response. And uh, uh, the interlimb reflexes, interlimb reflexes are the uh, crossed extensor reflexes. So now, both of them, if you are looking at extensor spasm and inter interlimb crossed extensor reflexes, we are absent here absent here in phase two absent here in phase three and they become exaggerated in uh, uh, phase four that is where the mass uh, mass reflex is uh, uh, present so now what is this extensor spasm a uh, briefly about extensor spasm this is also known as a positive supportive response this is one of the postural reflexes operating in the spinal cord the stimulation of the cutaneous receptors on the sole of the foot, the sole of the foot, the cutaneous receptors. So these uh, reflexly evoke or send inputs to the, uh, the spinal cord and they will make the extensor muscles uh, to be activated. And these extensor muscles contract, they make a rigid pillar-like structure. So that would uh, support the body weight to stand. So that means uh, as if the animal is landing on the surface, the surface is touching, this skin contact make the reflex and the extensor becomes uh, rigid and they will provide a pillar-like structure so that they can stand. So that is the uh, positive support response. Okay, so there is a, what is called a negative support response that I would uh, mention when I come back uh, uh, with the uh, postural reflexes. So this is an extensor spasm. That is what you see. And uh, they are exaggerated in the fourth phase, not in the uh, one, two, three phase it was absent. So you can just see that the extensor spasm was absent. The intercrossed extensor reflex. I mentioned the crossed extensor reflex is the the excitation of the uh, are producing a, um, the noxious stimulus here. The flexor reflexes, the flexor withdrawal reflexes. Uh, once they are activated, the extensors of the opposite limb they are they get activated. These are the interlimb reflexes. These interlimb reflexes were exaggerated in the fourth phase. Otherwise, they were upset. Then uh, there is what is called a neurogenic bladder. The neurogenic bladder is that uh, when there is a paralysis of the autonomic uh, 
autonomic paralysis. So that means the sphincter control um, is not there in the beginning, beginning stage, zero to one day. There is no sphincter control. The sphincter of SAK is not uh, uh, operative. So then uh, whatever the, um, uh, what happens, the, that is uh, the bladder is emptying without any control because there is a total loss, there is a reflexia or atonia of the abdominal muscles. Now, slowly what happens, uh, this is absent here, and slowly the sphincter of CK comes. And once the sphincter of CK comes, uh, the bladder becomes, um, what, what is the bladder becomes full, and uh, it has to be emptied. And the bladder, once it is becoming uh, full, because there is no control, the soup, supraspinal control is missing. In that case, this will be zero, zero. So then in the fourth phase, it becomes automatic. So that means uh, uh, the, the small activation would release the urine. This, this becomes a, a sort of a autogenic uh, uh, bladder. Till that time, the bladder control is missing because of the increased uh, sympathetic tone because this will recover sympathetic tone recovers within hours that's what uh, it has been seen now the spinal shock and urinary bladder now i want to mention that initially bladder is flaccid and unresponsive it becomes overfilled the urine dribbles through the sphincters this is called a uh, overflow incontinence so that means it's unresponsive. Now the it gets filled, and once it gets filled, the pressure is there, urine dribbles. That is overflowing continence. So then once the spinal shock uh, passes away, the widening reflex returns, some amount of widening, because uh, the reflex contraction of the sphincter of CK begins. And this uh, reflex contraction, now once the, the detrusor is getting filled up, the local circuitry, they would be operating and that would produce the widening reflex. Now, this would happen even for a small amount of urine because uh, there is no voluntary control. Because in the voluntary control, what happens? Uh, we have a urge to pass urine, but we hold it. We will suppress it because the circumstances are not um, congenial for passing up the urine. Under, because it's the socio or whatever the developmental evolutionary aspect. So they are not congenial and you hold it because of the voluntary. And this is coming from the supraspinal control. And as and when where we get the proper environment, we pass urine. That widening reflex and now which is started that would be activated. So this will be under the control of voluntary. There is no voluntary control. This in after the spinal shock passes, it automatically got emptying. So that means uh, some amount of urine get filled up and that stretches, that empties or relaxes the, the uh, spectrum. So then further, what happens? Some paraplegic patients over the years train themselves to initiate the widening uh, the wading of the urine or uh, passing of the urine by pinching or stroking their thighs. So this would produce a sort of a mini or a mild mass reflex. In the mass reflex, uh, there is an evacuation of the bladder that is seen. So mild mass reflex, uh, these paraplegic patients, they learn. So this is one of those uh, uh, tricks they try to learn because they have a problem because they cannot uh, go. In some instances, widening reflex becomes hyperactive. In the fourth stage, the bladder capacity is reduced and uh, the walls of the urinary bladder become hypertrophied and the bladder is sometimes called a, a spastic neurogenic bladder. Now, this hyperactivity is further worsened by infection because if there is an infection, there is irritation, then bladder wall, there is an increased uh, urine. Uh, they, they want to, uh, they have always urge to pass urine. Okay, this is uh, briefly about uh, a spinal shock and urinary bladder. Now, coming back with uh, that uh, chart. So now what I have mentioned, I have mentioned about uh, 
the delayed plantar response, bulbocavernous response. Uh, you can just see all of them here. So then uh, I, I talked about a reflex neurogenic bladder, 000, and it becomes uh, plus, plus, plus. This is the mass reflex. Then autonomic uh, reflexes, hyperreflexia. That is the autonomic reflexes becomes exaggerated. What are those autonomic reflexes? Just I want to mention that uh, these autonomic reflexes are fluctuations of blood pressure. Evacuation of a bowel and bladder, which we have seen in the mass reflex. Then there is a profuse sweating, depending upon the level of the lesion. Erection of the penis, there is again an autonomic response. The ejaculation of the semen, it is an autonomic response. All these things happen in a mass reflex. This is what the autonomic hyperreflexia. So now, if, if, if I go back here, so all these 12 reflexes, if I want to categorize, the delayed plantar response is the first one to appear and it disappears. These superficial reflexes, number two to six, they are absent, they become uh, exaggerated in the subsequent. The deep tendon reflexes and uh, these uh, seven to 10, these are the deep reflexes and these deep reflexes are absent here and uh, they are also mostly absent here and they become uh, slowly appear and they become exaggerated in uh, the face pore. Then about the bladder, there is absent and they become exaggerated, the mass reflex. Autonomic hyperreflexia, that means autonomic reflexes, they're absent in all these situations and they become exaggerated. So that means up to one to four, 12 months. This is what the story of uh, uh, the chronological events, uh, what happens after spinal shock. Immune cells migrate at the injury site and they release a number of uh, inflammatory mediators or chemicals. And these inflammatory mediators and chemicals, they will produce the damage. Already the neurons are damaged. They will produce the additional damage to the neuron. They will enhance the, the degeneration, especially uh, if it is cut at that level, malaria degeneration or uh, chromatolysis or whatever. They will enhance that process. And uh, uh, death of the neurons may occur at the, at the particular site in, because already they, there is a uh, cut and inflammation damage. And the second, the immune reaction or immune cells, they will further kill them. The second thing is uh, there is a loss of myelination. That is a part of the valerian degeneration. There is a, a loss of myelination. Loss of myelination leads to impairment of the conduction of the impulses. The conduction of the impulses. And uh, if there is an impairment of the conduction of the impulses, that is the function of the neuron is lost. There is a loss of function. That is one of those uh, conditions is uh, uh, subacute combined to degeneration, wherein uh, myelin synthesis is delayed or multiple sclerosis where myelination is involved. Okay, now second is a disruption or loss of exons. Exons are uh, destroyed, that is part of the valerian degeneration, cutting off the lines uh, of communication either way to the muscle or to the brain, either the distal site going towards muscle or going up. Now, what is happening? We are trying to look at the at the site where in the in the level of the lesion. So below the level of the lesion, nothing happens. But the only thing that those particular neurons they do not receive the inputs of the the inputs of which they they are getting stimulated. Several weeks after initial injury, the area of the tissue damage has been cleared by the microglial cells. And once that is cleared, it is filled with the uh, fluid, and these fluid filled the cavity makes the glial scar that is left with. Now these cavitation, they are called syrinx. The cavitation, they are called syrinx, which acts as a barrier to the reconnection of the two uh, sides of the damaged cord. That means uh, a regrowth, the, the neurites which are growing. So because of the cavity, they do not uh, permit to make the uh, unit uh, that uh, the, both of them making their contact or uh, uh, re restructuring or regrowth or regeneration.
so this comes the sphinx makes the uh, barrier for that and uh, in addition there will be several molecules released because of the immune cells or the surrounding cells that inhibit the regrowth of the, uh, the damaged exons and uh, that is uh, where it produces this is what happens uh, in the spinal cord where it is uh, damaged okay so then what are the uh, treatment strategies first thing is the maintenance of the general health of the person or the patient that's the first and foremost thing as a doctor you used to do the second part is managing the immediate effects of the spinal cord injury so that means a, a bladder catheterization the bowel maintenance of those things preventing bed sore development and uh, uh, keeping the personal hygiene and, and preventing the infection this is the immediate effects uh, which are unrelated to the spinal cord but uh, for the general health so that you have to manage the nutrition and all those aspects attending the injury or a trauma related issues because there are certain issues which you need to attend to them immediately so that uh, the progression of the disease becomes a uh, uh, overall improvement uh, you may expect then there are specific treatments which are directed to improve the recovery of the spinal cord injury these are the number 4 then finally the rehabilitation and physiotherapy these are the five headings uh, i our treatment strategies should be i will not deal with all of them i will just mention about what are the injury related issues only one or two aspects i would just mention so suppose if the injury injury related issues some bone fragments are remaining in the, the whatever the injury so you remove them by surgery so that would help to help to restore the connectivity and you make those vertebral columns uh, straight so that uh, there is alignment of the cord and the uh, the vertebra so that uh, there is a sprouting and they will uh, get uh, they bring the bring them to approximation that is one part the second part there is a, what is called a spinal fusion surgery which the gap using the uh, some matrix uh, molecules or matrix proteins or matrix uh, molecules so that would help for the the fusion of these things so then various brain and spinal cord imaging tests to be done so that you can assess the reflexes the level of um, cognition and other motor skills then you give them antibiotics to prevent the infection at the site then if it is involving the respiration you put him on a ventilator that means assisted respiration so then you look for the plan for physiotherapy and how you are going to rehabilitate the individual so that also you have to think then mental counseling so that means the person is already down because of the the spinal cord injury because of the incapacitation and uh, the physical disability so you have to give him a, a keep him proper spirits these are uh, injury related issues so then these are the specific treatment strategies that will help for the recovery of the regeneration of the spinal cord so that means uh, there are two aspects here there is an immediate aspect and a delayed aspect immediate aspect following the injury you try to limit the degeneration process how you can do that you can limit the degeneration process by improving the vascularity and oxygenation of the tissue suppose if there is a, a vascularity or vascular thing is uh, compromised uh, you try to improve the vascularity and uh, you try to limit the inflammatory reaction so that means you give them the anti inflammatory drugs uh, so that the inflammatory reaction is not uh, too much uh, to kill the kill the uh, neuronal cells then delayed ones uh, these would be necessary to rebuild and uh, reconnect or regenerate the injured neurons and the injured cord so that means uh, you should use the neurotropins to stimulate the axonal growth you use the the sprouting molecules the nerve growth factors or other growth factors use them so that axonal growth is uh, uh, or axonal sprouting takes place and uh, 
the block those molecules which inhibit because there will be a uh, number of cytokines and uh, the TNF alpha or something like that again the pro-inflammatory molecules you inhibit that they will they will stop inhibit the regeneration you stop them or block them and supply new cells to replace the lost ones that means uh, the implantation of the stem cells that would help because if the gap is too much then you place the stem cells so that they would grow and then try to make a proper contact. So then building bridges to span the lesion cavity. Suppose if there is a cavity is formed, you remove the cavity and put the matrix material. So this is the, the delayed. And both of these approaches are important to restore the last connectivity and uh, uh, prevent further degeneration. This is the specific treatment for uh, the spinal cord then about the rehabilitation of the physiotherapy exercise therapy to strengthen muscles and maintain healthy body weight medications such as painkillers antibiotics and antidepressants the psychotherapy to aid uh, to help the individuals to be positive and manage the injury then uh, even the family counseling is required family education to help uh, uh, the understand the problem of the patient and uh, give the supportive and assistive technology such as a wheelchair, artificial respirator and uh, uh, other, other things uh, which uh, the person is able to do for himself. Okay, these are all the, uh, the treatment strategies. I am not, uh, uh, though I had given a sufficient background, the, the details uh, you would be taught in the neurology or the medicine department or neurosurgery. To summarize what we studied, spinal shock is state of non-responsiveness of the spinal activity due to sudden loss of supraspinal influences because of the injury. And he will manifest have immediate and delayed changes. And now the current, currently it is in four different phases. The phase one, a reflexia, phase two, initial reflex return, phase three, early hyperreflexia, phase four, late hyperreflexia. The various mechanisms involved, these are described. Recovery of various reflexes happening in a sequential manner have been demonstrated. The various reflexes I had mentioned, the physiological mention involved in each stage are elaborated. The spinal cord injury results in the loss of neuronal and glial cells because of the inflammation. And this results in external, uh, this results in external sprouting and its failure because uh, the exons, those sprout, they may not be able to contact and they will fail. And uh, that would make the formation of the cavitation. And uh, this cavitation delays further, further uh, regeneration. Specific treatment strategies are focused to prevent the regeneration and then to promote the growth of the neural elements have been summarized. Overall, I have given uh, the treatment strategies. I have given uh, more than uh, present in the standard textbooks or even the standard textbook, you may not get uh, all this uh, type of information. Okay, so now the assignment here, I am just giving you uh, define spinal shock, describe the different stages of spinal shock, briefly describe the plan of uh, treatment. So in, in reference to yesterday's, I had added this thing. Then a right note, right short notes on. I have mentioned these things, a reflexia or hyperreflexia, initial reflex return, early hyperreflexia, late hyperreflexia, uh, cremastic reflex, bulbocavernous reflex, H reflex, Autonomic hyperreflexia, neurogenic bladder. You try to write the short notes on uh, these things, especially these. Uh, any one of them may be short note questions. Okay. Uh, today's uh, talk is mainly based on the uh, the latest information I have got from these uh, Nature publishers uh, that is on the spinal cord by Dicino and Associates. So they, they mentioned all these four phases and uh, they give the details. I have tried to 
give comprehensively about that uh, information. Of course, there are certain things which I had uh, referred the Samson Wright's physiology, the Genangs, and guidance. Next class, I will talk about uh, uh, the physiological aspects of the various spinal cord injury. Uh, till then, uh, thank you 